Hello, and welcome to Angry Robot Live, number two, Crossing the Streams. I am sending out the YouTube link so that people can watch us here. And people should be able to come and join us. For those who don't know, I'm our host, Mike Underwood, a Sales and Marketing Manager for Angry Robot. And I'm very honored today to be joined by Emma Newman, Marianne DePierres, and Rod Duncan, uh, some of our fine authors. Today we're going to be talking about crossing the streams and cross-genre storytelling. And I've selected this panel since all of our, our authors for Angry Robot and in other places write stories and tell stories in a way that crosses genre boundaries, they still tell stories in multiple formats, and I wanted to dig into their experiences, some of the stories that they enjoy that cross boundaries, and then we'll have an audience discussion with questions that you can ask here, and we're going to be following Angry Robot Live, the hashtag on Twitter. So starting with Emma on my left, we're going to have our panelists give a short introduction of their, themselves and their work. Hello, I'm Emma Newman, and I don't know whether to look at my computer screen or the webcam because it's freaking me out. Which one do I look at? Oh my god! So uh, I'm just going to talk about my books. <laughs> so um, I write the Split World series, and uh, the first book of the series is Between Two Thorns. Um, and I also write and produce and host uh, Tea and Jeopardy, uh, which is, um, oh, I can now say is Hugo nominated. Yes. <laughs> so um, yes, that's um, I'm, I'm responsible for that with um, the very lovely Peter Newman. So uh, yeah, that's what I do. Excellent. And Marianne. Uh, hi, I'm Marianne De Pierre. Um, been writing science fiction and fantasy for about close on 20 years now, and published a number of novels. Um, my most recent novel is Peacemaker, uh, a cross-genre novel with Angry Robot which has just also recently been optioned for game. Um, it's going to be a novel adventure game, a little bit like The Walking Dead. So, um, yeah, I've been in the industry for a long time and I'm um, excited about this new novel that I've got out. That's me. Great. And Rod? Hi there. My name is Rod Duncan. I'm uh, maybe more known as a crime novelist to this point, but that's all about to change because uh, my... Uh, Alternate History series, uh, which is called The Fall of the Gaslit Empire, is just about to be launched with the first novel in September, which is The Bullet Catcher's Daughter. Uh, but I also dabble in other areas such as filmmaking, and so a bit of a maybe a jack of all trades? I don't know. Hmm. Well, then that is a, a fantastic role to have at Angry Robot since we embrace all sorts of genre storytelling. Uh, given is that uh, our, our mighty logline is inspired by Lee and Mark is SFF and WTF question mark? <laughs> so I gathered you all together um, because I think you are some of our, our best examples of cross-genre storytelling. So with Emma Newman, I see the split worlds as incorporating elements of urban fantasy, of historical fantasy, and some elements of romance. With Marianne's... Sorry? And hard-boiled as well. Yes, there is definitely some hard-boiled, gar gargoyle, soulless detective action. Um, and then Marianne's Peacemaker is a fantastic melange of genres with Western, futuristic science fiction, urban fantasy, crime. Um, so some great crossing there. And I was just kind of blown away by the, the genre combinations there. And uh, Rod's Gaslit Empire is an alternate history, but also has what I see as strong elements of crime carrying forward uh, from that tradition. So I'm, I'm going to be excited to dig into each of your process and how you combine these different flavors. Um, so I'd like to start with, uh, with Marianne in asking, like, how did you do the design work and the, the concept that led to Peacemaker and being such a combination of different genres and influences? Um, I think it was probably a long time in the making. You know, I, I grew up reading Westerns. My dad was a big Westerns fan, and I've always been waiting for that moment that um, 
you know, sort of searching for the right story. And I think I needed to do my apprenticeship in other genres before I came back to it. So it wasn't something that I set out to do. Uh, it's it's um, the, the more and more I write, the more I feel that my subconscious has complete control over me. <laughs> and uh, so when I when I came up with the character and the world, which was loosely based on a short story I'd written a while ago, um, just everything poured in at once. And I've, um, I get bored easily, I think. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, to me, mixing genres is is really exciting to read. So I think um, it was it was not it wasn't a plan. It kind of just happened, but it was something that had been bubbling along for a long time. Cool. I could go on for hours about that, but I think <laughs> that's enough for the moment. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely plenty more we can tease out, but uh, let's move in. So, Rod, um, you came from a crime background being a uh, CWA, John Creasy, Dagger nominee. What, uh, what led you into writing an alternate history, and kind of how did you decide and design the Gaslit Empire to incorporate those different genre elements? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I suppose my first uh, novels, although they were sold as crime, they didn't neatly fit into that category either. I'm a bit of a bad boy when it comes to mixing up genres, I think. Um, I think living in Leicester, which is known as a kind of Victorian city in terms of its architecture, uh, you, you get the sense that there is a, another world superimposed on, on our modern world all the time as you walk around. So you may see for example, uh, the, the Victorian cobbles just breaking through where the frosts lifted the tarmac in the winter, or all this sort of proud indications of empire in, in the, uh, the slogans and phrases that you see emblazoned on some of the grand buildings. And so, so this sense of there being this Victorian-esque world almost actually existing, I don't really need to make very much of it up in that sense. Um, as for the mixing of crime with it, well, I, I don't know. I think that it's obviously where I've come from in terms of uh, my uh, previous novels. And, and I suppose influences for me, um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is a, a very strong influence for me in the, that mixture of Victorian and uh, crime fiction. So that would be a, probably a, a launching off point anyway. In terms of building the world, and I suppose I, I started off with the desire to find some sort of logical reason how we could have a Victorian-esque world still existing today. And, uh, and so I, I kind of reached back a couple of hundred years into time and tweaked something very small, which I propose would have the domino effect of things changing to uh, allow us to arrive in the present day and uh, and yet still have all that glorious um, Victorian-esque fashion and technology mm. still around. Very cool. And I'm going to uh, jump on your point of worlds kind of juxtaposed on one another and then go over to Emma's split worlds where we see you know, Mundanus, we see Exilium, and we see the Nether and there's all sorts of worlds layered on worlds and kind of a sense of history layered on to a sense of modernity. And so for Emma, how did you take hard-boiled historical elements that are almost somewhat Regency, somewhat Victorian, somewhat maybe almost even Renaissance, um, mm -hmm. like Elizabethan, figure out the mix of history and continuity and modernity and throw a hard-boiled gargoyle detective in the, in the mix. <laughs> and what was your process there in developing the world and setting the tone for the split worlds? Uh, complicated. <laughs> so it, I guess it kind of... Um, well, I think the idea of having the world coexisting came from living very close to Bath and walking around and because so many of the Georgian buildings still exist there and you can walk inside them and walk past them and one of my favorite places there, the assembly rooms has recently been completely refurbished and, and restored so it's like walking back in time um, it was the idea of 
it's still existing and I was thinking what if you could just kind of walk through just take a step sideways almost and then be in the place where that vibrant world is still there and then it was it was kind of like like Rod says kind of a, a logical process how could that be there why would that be there and then thrown into it were some elements of a role-playing game I ran for my husband um, several years before where I was mashing up superheroes and fae and um, also a um, desolate, uh, a dissolute use rather of um, role playing far too much and playing uh, Vampire Masquerade and becoming completely obsessed throughout most of my university years with kind of secret powerful beings um, being completely heartless and evil and kind of controlling human society from the background um, and um, a complete hatred of the disnification of fairies and all of it kind of got thrown into this pot um, and I wanted to write fairies that were really, really scary again. They, they should be frightening. I went back to the she and the, the Irish mythology, and the things they do are appalling. And it really bothered me on, like, you know, as, as a matter of principle, that so many people are wandering around in 2014 thinking fairies are cute and lovely, and they <laughs> should not. So I wanted to correct that. Um, and then as for the, the gargoyle, well, once I started to kind of put power structures into place, being a kind of geeky GM type, I had to work out power balance um, because if you're going to have one hugely massively powerful magical faction, um, to have the world the way I wanted it to be I had to have a kind of counterbalancing um, powerful faction as well so that one would not completely overrun the other and then some uh, some backstory popped to my head that happened a thousand years ago to explain why England the way England is the way it is historically, and my God, I'm ranting like a mad woman. But anyway, the, the kind of the arbiter gargoyle, uh, the hard-boiled detective element uh, came in because there had to be a manner of policing hugely powerful magical creatures that had been booted out of reality a thousand years ago and kept trying to get back in effectively. Um, and of course, when magic metaphysically that they use is based on the soul, the most logical thing to do would be to dislocate the soul of your policemen. And so that's what they do. They dislocate their soul, they stick it in a jar um, in the place in between where the fairies are imprisoned and exilium and the real world. And they make sure that they don't do anything dodgy. But of course, any kind of treaty has loopholes and the Fae being very clever exploited loopholes and created the nether, which is a world in between our mundane world and their prison where there's an entire society that's grown and become established for hundreds of years. So all of a sudden there were kind of three worlds that all coexisted and were interrelated. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it happened. And then I dropped the superhero bit. And then there was this other thing that popped up and, oh my goodness, it's so big and I've talked enough. So there you go. Fantastic. So that, uh, that brings up a, an interesting point that I think applies to both, both of our other panelists' series. So for, for Marianne, in, uh, in the Virgin Jackson series, we have Rangers. And then Rod, in the Gaslight Empire, we have the Patton organization. Kind of how, at what point did those, those characters or those organizations as kind of keepers of the status quo come in? And how do you think that fits into the different kind of genre elements and influences that you've got going on? And we'll start with Rod. Oh gosh! <laughs> Sorry, I was hoping you weren't going to start with me. Um, yeah, I was thinking you. <laughs> um, I I think this this goes back to the um, the question of working out. I, I suppose in the the vision of it, the the kind of enjoyment of this uh, aesthetic that I wanted to create. I, uh, I I knew where I wanted to go. I knew what the what the the world wanted to feel like, as in sort of tonally. But uh, in order to to justify how that could be the case, how the the, the advancement of uh, social change and technological change that we witness every day, how that would have been arrested. So I needed an, uh, some kind of force to to artificially hold that back. And so here we have the the International Patent Office, which is an organisation set up by treaty between the various founding nations of this great accord to 
protect the well-being of the common man. I use the word man here because that's what they would say because they're quite a sexist sort of society. And um, so th you have to have this, this organization that can act internationally to enforce this this treaty so that if any one nation starts to develop armaments that are um, outside the, the what is allowed by the patent office then all the other nations will be uh, instructed by the patent office to step in and reduce that nation to rubble so it so we have this artificial holding back and um, I suppose in terms of influences there really I'm influenced by different views of history that we see in fiction inexorable tide that um, you, you know no individual can alter uh, no matter what no matter sort of how powerful that individual is given a large enough galactic civilization there it's mathematically predictable and on the other hand the sort of Robert Harris alternate fiction alternate uh, history sorry idea which we see in fatherland where he kind of reaches back into a point in, in World War II with uh, the code breakers at Bletchley Park and postulates that if they perhaps had an odd day or two when they were ill or off then they would not have been able to crack the naval enigma code and uh, Britain would have been forced to surrender and so the whole complete different history will have emerged and so I, I kind of like to play around with these two versions of history both of which I'm attracted to and uh, which seem incompatible, kind of like quantum mechanics and relativity, but we, we can kind of, common sense tells us that there are, there's reality in both of them. So in a sense, I suppose that's what I'm playing around with in invoking the patent office and seeing how long it is they can hold back this inexorable tide of history from going where it wants to go. Well, and that's a good segue since uh, Marianne, your series kind of projects history forward, and then we have Virgin and her colleagues as people trying to maintain a sense of history with the park. So there's your segue. Okay. Well, um, I guess I, I, I don't know whether it's following the same line as Rod, but um, I guess Peacemaker is essentially, a, well, it's about preserving the land. I mean, the whole first novel is, is about this parkland, which is the last remaining natural habitat. Um, and I wanted a main character who is t tapping into the kind of mythology, the cowboy mythology of a story like Shane, uh, the outsider, the loner, yet law-abiding, but not not bound as bound by law as as um, well in 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 the way I saw it anyway. Not as bound by law as a police per, a police policeman or a police person would be. So I, f I felt that the ranger it, it it offered dual things to me. It it meant that um, I could I could exploit that concept of the of the outsider and the stranger, um, the loner, which she very much is. Um, but the strong sense of uh, connection with the land, something something really passionate that they are fighting for and about, um, and it gave to me intrinsically being a ranger, it gave meaning to to her without even her even having to utter a word. So it, it uh, yet it didn't bind her in all sorts of law that would make it impossible for her to be her. So it just worked really well um, as a on many levels. Um, that the whole concept of being a ranger, plus there was the familial association. Her father was a ranger. Her father's father was a ranger. Um, and then I also was playing with the 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 female ranger as opposed to you bring in the because uh, her colleague, her main colleague, is um, is a U.S. marshal who comes out to Australia and as she's forced to work with. So then I'm kind of um, pitting not only the male-female roles against each other, but culturally the U.S. Marshals Service against the, the Outback Ranger. So there was so many things that it just tapped into that I could muck around with that it was it just seemed um, right. Um, so yeah, 
that was a bit of a jumbled explanation. Sorry. No, it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> and I, I definitely invite you all to kind of jump in and comment on one yeah. another's uh, uh, work and, and thoughts as well, so that it doesn't have to be, you know, I will ask this person a question, and then we'll go over here, and I will make gesture <laughs> hands that will make use of foreshortening. So something okay. else that, that I think is, is cool and, uh, and nicely applicable is that you all tell stories across media and are working on telling stories across different media. Um, so starting with Emma, how do, you, how do you think differently when telling a story or building the story for a role-playing game versus a podcast versus uh, mm. your, your, your prose writing? And kind of how does crossing that boundary change how you approach storytelling? Uh, well, I think in all of this, storytelling comes first. That's the critical thing. Um, and then in each of the different mediums, you have different tools to serve that master. So um, when GMing or running a game, you have to consider things like your players and you know, what, what experience they would want to have and what experience and story you want to tell and how you're making the story together. Um, but ultimately, your job as a GM is, is to create the world and to tell a good story there. And, and that's kind of the same thing in a novel or in a podcast. Um, and when I'm doing tea and jeopardy, there are um, elements um, where it's like audio theatre. I mean, it's incredibly silly audio theatre, but it's still having to tell a story by using sound effects alone. And so the story comes first, um, and then everything else has to serve that. Um, one of the things that I found very, very useful um, in terms of the kind of the crossover between GMing and writing novels is um, being trained as a GM over many, many years to kind of think about pacing um, and introducing kind of tension and mystery and the drive to find out more um, and giving enough information at the right times to keep the players, straight readers, engaged, um, but also thinking about things in terms of system, and I'm not a system head in, in any sense, a lot of it bores me deeply, but it was hugely helpful um, thinking about it in terms of um, the split worlds, because I had to make sure that power was balanced, and that things could um, be logical in the way that they opposed each other, and what they drew power from, and and all kinds of things like that. That was a really, really useful way to think about it. But, you know, I'm a GURPS girl. I just want, you know, quick, easy, and dirty and not to be rolling dice forever. So, you know, I can't say that it influences a huge amount. But having to think about the world metaphysically and how that um, demonstrates and manifests in the world, um, there is definitely a crossover between role playing and uh, writing. And how do, you, how do you kind of design story differently when you know that for a role-playing game, there's player agency involved. Like, what kind of uh, contingencies do you have to make, and how, to, and how does that then come back and help you as a writer uh, to any degree, uh, in terms of prose, sorry? Uh, I think both are, are very good at teaching you how to wing it and to um, not go mental when your player or your character decides to do something totally random and walk away from the thing that you set up for them to explore and have so much fun with, and then they're like, oh, shiny, over there. Some of the best things that I've run in games have been because the characters or the players have decided to approach something completely differently or do something other than the main plot, and I've just thrown something in which has suddenly appeared as a major plot line later in the game, and that is thrilling and enjoyable, and that happens in books too. And you know, I, I will plan novels, but sometimes things just, when you get to that scene, when you're in that room writing that conversation with the characters, and you suddenly think, actually, this is not turning out the way that I imagined it would, knowing all those times that my players have done something that I completely failed to predict, and that it didn't just break everything, and in fact it makes better and cooler things happen, is, is a kind of a reassuring thing when you get to that scene and think, it's okay, let's take let's go in a different direction, it's fine. I'm sure it will be all fine in the end. And also the, the thing to remember, being most important, being the characters, not the plot. You know, I hate games where, you know, you're, you feel as a player that you're being railroaded down plots that the GM has spent three weeks streaming up, um, and they're constantly forcing you back into. I hate that. I like it all to be... Um, very much character oriented 
And so if you get to a scene and it changes, as long as it's the characters that are changing it, that's fine. And, and I think it's the same with role playing and the same with writing books. And then for, yeah, uh, for Marianne, uh, you've got this one series that is now primed to be a prose series. It's been in a comics form and is now going into a story game. Um, to what degree have you been involved with these different incarnations and how do you think the world and the characters are going to have and will change in these different incarnations? Uh, well, it's been a really interesting process for me because uh, Peacemaker started out as, a, as I mentioned, a short story probably six, seven, eight years ago. When I picked it up again and started looking at it for a novel, and I changed a lot of things in it because originally it was set in the outback, whereas it's actually, you know, there is no outback anymore uh, in the novel. I started writing the novel, I got about 60 pages into it and it, I became gripped by this notion that it should be a comic. Never written a comic in my life, read plenty. Um, and it, you know, why then, you know, why that particular project, why this story, I still really don't know except that it was so incredibly visually bright in my mind that I just had to see it drawn and I can't draw. So. Um, I went about, you know, finding an artist and you know talking about my vision and and trying to learn how to write a comic and and we produced the first issue. Um, subsequently, she had had to go and do other things and so we never got to produce the second issue, which I have got written there. I haven't been able to find anyone to replace her. But I guess the interesting thing from it was that I then went on and I wrote or finished the novel, and I realised that. I do have a completely different process and I don't know, because I don't know enough about comic writing, I don't know whether this is a common experience, but I found that I really had to have a very clear idea of the end with the comic when I started writing it. With the novel, I could have a kind of idea of the end and I didn't really need to know what was happening in the middle um, because I get bored if I do that. I, I just felt it was, it was, I had to be, the clarity had to be much greater uh, and so when I went back to finishing it as a novel, there was things that I'd already created in two issues of the comic that I hadn't even encountered in the novel to that point. So I don't know if it's just about the condensation of it, the fact that it's it's you know you've got so few words and you know really compared to a novel you know the text is so so much smaller. So I'd be really interested to know if. Um, if Rod or Emma has ha have had that experience at all uh, with their writing and changing mediums. Um, so now it's finished and it's being adapted into a game um, and I will be hopefully doing some of the writing on the game. Again, like I was with the comic, I'm probably not sure what I'm doing but I'll be interested to see how that affects um, how I write the next one in the series and whether it changes the, that process having written the game because it did affect me. Going, um, going to the finish the novel after I had written a comic. So, it's kind of it's been a really weird journey. I haven't had that experience with anything else that I have written. So I'd be interested to know if you guys have had that kind of. It's kind of messed with my head a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead. Uh, but I, I didn't know because I've just been talking, so I was going to see if Rob wanted to. Um, but in terms of uh, the knowing the overall arc and being okay with not knowing what happens in the middle um, is exactly the same with running a game. And in both, for me, understanding the underlying metaphysic right from the start is critical because if your players, in the game this is, if your players run off and do something completely um, left field, um, I need to know what the effects are going to be. So I need to understand the metaphysics so I don't say, oh, well, this happens like off the top of my head and it's completely ridiculous and the world loses all of its internal consistency. And, mm -hmm. and with a novel, by the same extension, understanding how it all works kind of underneath um, and knowing what the end point is so that you can kind of have foreshadowing of things. But you can fix that in the second draft, but. Knowing where the, the kind of the overall arc is enough and 
like you, I get really, really bored if I plan more than five chapters ahead. I, I like to plan a little bit ahead because it's efficient, but um, yeah, I'm very happy not to know and to see where the characters decide to go and what they want to do, but I have an end point in mind for both. Mm. Yeah. Rod? Hey, Rod. Rod! Oh, no. Has he been frozen? I don't know. He looks very Let's look Let it go, He's Rod. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Rod! Oh, Come back. Me. Oh, no. Um, well, doll charmed. He, may, he may be frozen and have to, uh, to pop back in. Um, so for the moment, we'll roll on to another topic, um, and we can, can come back in when we need to. Mike, can I just ask? Um, yeah, please. Uh, so, Emma, does that mean you'll help me with my game writing? <laughs> oh my god, I would love to. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> computer gamer as well, so okay. I would love I'll to. Call you. At some point. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated to see how that will go because I've I've just adored the Telltale games. Um, that played the Walking Dead one. And then I've just gotten a little bit into the um, the fables one. So if you're using the same format, um, I'll be really interested to to hear your process. Please blog about it. Yeah, I will. Um, the the company I'm working with, Stirfire, they're a s um, Australian company, and um, they're kind of um, educating me as we go along about things. And they're a great bunch of people. Um, they have had quite a lot of success with their most recent game, Freedom Fall. And um, when I went and look, started looking through The Walking Dead, I was really quite... And I'm not a big zombie fan, I'll tell you right now. I'm not a big zombie fan, but it really gripped me. I was terrified. <laughs> I was sweating while I was playing it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, anything that can get you like that, well, you know, hopefully we can have that kind of effect anyway. I so it'd be interesting. I couldn't carry on with The Walking Dead game because it scared me too much. And I was, yeah. I was, I was convalescing, and uh, I thought, this is making me so tense. This is actually not going to help me get better. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to be resting, and I'm like, <laughs> all the way through. So, yeah, let's go back to it now. Uh, yeah, it took me a long time to, to get through it. Um, I think the yeah. way that it limits your options for me was part of what made it so terrifying. Yeah. Is that there are only a few decision points and it really heightens the tension on those points. Actually, that's, yeah, that, that's probably exactly what I experienced. You've, you've put it into words for me. Thank you, Mike. Um, so it looks like Rod's computer froze, so we can um, move on and talk a little bit about some other things, and hopefully he'll be able to rejoin us. Um, and pretty soon we'll start taking questions from the audience. So um, folks who are watching, please start to, uh, to think about your questions, and then you, can, you should be able to use the Q&A app if you're watching. We have one question already. Excellent. Um, so other folks can ask that. And then if you, if you want to v upvote a question, you should be able to, to, to click a plus one on it um, if, for other folks who are watching. So if, there's, if somebody asks a question you're really interested in, you can upvote that, and it will make it easy for me to see what people are interested in hearing about. Uh, but for now, I wanted to, to kind of broaden the conversation and see if there were other stories or uh, films or, or games that, um, that one or the either of you really enjoy that you think cross boundaries in terms of formats, and that's whether that's a tie-in or it's a video game adaption of something or just a story that has different genre elements or combines different feels, um, particularly ones that have, have moved you or you really enjoyed. Mm. Emma, you go. You go. <laughs> I was um, I was saying to my husband this morning that I have completely forgotten every single novel that's cross genre that I have ever read, and I can't even think clearly about what is genre and setting and theme and all these things. And the only thing I could remember was Cowboys versus Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's as as clear a genre crossing story as there's ever been, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking that it's actually they. I, I mean, I know that it's just silly popcorn fun, um, but I actually quite enjoyed it. I don't know if I should be ashamed to say that. I'm not, no, I'm not going to be ashamed. So I enjoyed it. It has Harrison Ford in it, and, and the other chap is quite nice to look at. And you know, aliens and cat. What's not to love? It's just silly fun. But the thing that I did like about it was that it took real kind of Western 
genre tropes and genuine alien story yeah. and and genuinely threw them together. It wasn't like, um, for example, the time traveler's wife, which from I couldn't finish it because it was. Um, too much romance and not enough time travel and I did not know when I started it that it was actually a romance novel so I was constantly thinking when, when are we going to learn time, time, travel? time travel what's going on I want to understand what's happening here and is there a machine and what's going to happen and it was like no 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 like, this is actually a romance story with elements which are there to serve the romance story so for me that is a romance novel it's not a genre mashup at all mm -hmm. because everything exists to, to push yeah. the relationship forward. I don't know if it changes later on because I, I didn't finish it. That's actually a really interesting point, Emma, because I think that can be one of the big dangers with blending uh -huh. genres is that yeah. the balance. And, you know, uh, I've read a bit about people saying that you have to have the dominant genre if you're mixing genres. You can't, you know, you can't give them all equal time. I don't know whether I agree with that or not, but I do know that readers are going to come to a, a genre blend novel um, with an expectation like that. I want the time. I want the science fiction. I want more of the science fiction. No, I want more of the fantasy. No, I want more of the. And if you don't meet that expectation, then they're not necessarily going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And that is the inherent danger with writing it. And I think. Um, as a writer, you have to recognise that and just, um, you know, honour your own work and not not worry about too much of it, about t about that too much. Um, you know, I and expectations too about things like, because um, you know, to me, Firefly obviously was such a great example of science fiction western. Like it was so good, so good. And when I was writing this, I was very conscious that I didn't want to write anything near that ballpark because when you have such an iconic text like that that will never, everything will always compare badly to, um, you really want to stay away from it. But it's a reference point for people as well. So, um, yeah, you, it, it's, it's, it's touchy ground, you know. You can, you can go down in flames. <laughs> And I, I think the expectation thing that you say is, is critical because I went into reading that book with entirely the wrong expectations. And so I spent years thinking, well, there's something wrong with me because everybody on this planet seems to love this book except me. And then I realized I was just the wrong person and also approaching it in the wrong way. Um, and with, with the Split World series, it is such a... It's just a weird set of books. And it, the other kind of hurdle when you write genre mashup books where you've got lots and lots of different things all mashed in together is how the hell do I actually explain what this is? Because there are so many different things in it. It's Sometimes it's not easy to just say, it's oh, it's X meets X. Um, because I think also because when you're the author as well, you're so in it that you can't you know, tease out things and explain what the reader would approach and like the most anyway. And that's why we have people like you, Mike, obviously. You can do that yeah. part for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, to get it work, it, to get it to work, it has to kind of become one large organic whole. So yeah. then it becomes to, to then sort of distance yourself and define it, as you say. Um, I've always found if there's a mystery at the centre of it or a question that needs to be answered, then I'm, as a reader, I can pretty much accept anything, you know. If I can, if I'm hooked along by that essential, I have to know what's going to happen at the end. And so that's what I try and do when I blend my genres, is try and have such a strong dramatic question that people want to find out anyway, regardless of if there's not quite enough romance or uh, there's not enough science fiction. I mean, I, I, with Peacemaker, I really never, it's not really science, there is underlying science fiction concepts in it, but it's, you know, it's largely an urban fantasy. And um, so if you come to it expecting science, uh, straight out science fiction, then you're not going to get it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting, it, it doesn't stop me from wanting to write genre blend novels, but it's something I'm quite aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like we've got Rod back. Hi, sorry Rod. Sorry about the uh, little. Sorry about that. No, computer, thanks for computer crashed out. Yeah, I'm glad you could come back. 
Um, so we've been talking about stories that we've enjoyed that cross genres and cross boundaries. Um, and Marianne just came, uh, raised a, a cool point that I, I'd love to pose to you, Rod, um, to bring you back in, is when is a genre a setting versus when is it a plot element, and how does that change how you mix the two? Um, I think I would tend to look at uh, genres in terms of being like a center of gravity rather than a boundary condition, if that makes <laughs> sense. I would prefer to see them as a, a, a as kind of cluster in n-dimensional space for mathematicians. Um, and I, I, I think I, I like that better because it's it's obviously multidimensional in, in, in that a genre is, is um, identified in terms of many different spectra uh, in which it, the, the, they might vary <coughs> and uh, sort of setting and plot and all, all kinds of things like this. Um, and I, I can understand that there are times when it's much more comfortable to be able to define a genre and say this is what it definitely is and, I, and I've seen that particularly with, uh, with steampunk I think where, where people perhaps who would feel a great allegiance and have a great sophistication of understanding about that that genre um, feel put out when they see perhaps games being badged as steampunk when they wouldn't personally think that they were and and so there, there comes this instinct to try to, to to make a definition which will say what's within but that also says what's without, and I, I, I'm much less comfortable with that. So this idea, for me, is the gravitational metaphor that that there is no new book, there is no new film or game that doesn't exert its gravitational influence. Hmm. Hmm. I agree. Oh no, have we lost him again? Things that are in orbit around a certain genre when they're really very close. Uh, so that's that's the, the model that I tend to see, and I think genre, in that sense, is dynamic because every new thing that that comes along, every new creation that comes along, adds to its weight to the that that overall gravitational pull. Yeah, that's a very neat explanation of it, Rod. Thank you. Yeah, I. I will probably have to steal that and uh, and attribute to uh, to you in uh, in other conversations. So, uh, Marianne or Emma, um, what would you say to the notion of of kind of genre elements used for setting, genre elements used for plot, or used for character, and how how does that different mix and different orientation um, change the storytelling or the expectations? Uh, I think um, some genres influence it more than others, or or maybe it's just that I understand their mechanics better than I do like the others, I don't know, but I'm thinking about thriller and romance. Um, I don't think I've come across a romantic thriller, but they probably do exist, but with thrillers, um, it's often the, the things that I've come across in which I, I don't actually like anymore, it's, you know, person uncovers weird thing, obtains some kind of MacGuffin, then people chase them trying to obtain the MacGuffin, um, will they get to the place where they can do something with the MacGuffin or figure out what what happens when they reveal it to the world or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But you know that they're all going to be okay at the end and that the evil forces that have pursued them are not going to succeed. And with romance, um, in terms of novels, for me, that genre means that everything, you can have it set anywhere, any time period, all manner of things can happen, but everything has to be there to serve the romantic progression um, and that they, um, more often than not, a lot more often than not, end up happily ever after. Um, and so if I was writing a romance novel, I would approach it completely differently to the way that I approached um, with the split worlds. Because I was quite surprised when you said that you saw romance being one of the genres mixed in with the split worlds. And I don't at all. I see those as, as kind of incidental things that happen because people are just being people. Um, and uh, a lot of romance kind of happens and is rejected in people's real lives and that happens a lot in the split worlds because people keep interfering with people's relationships. Um, but it's not a genre that I actively mixed in um, when I was kind of writing the novels. Um, I feel like I just babbled. I don't know if I've even answered your question. 
No, that's a it's a, a, a interesting point where you have plot elements that are often associated with a genre. Like so, would those be satellites in the orbit of a genre, where there's romantic elements in a story, but it's not consciously a romance? Yeah. And and how does and how can it seems like maybe that can miss signal some to readers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where their expectations don't necessarily match your reality, and and how do you set the expectations right away for readers or viewers so that they they know that the mix of the genres is going to be what you're planning to do. Like, how do you signpost that? I don't know if you ever can, because you never know what your reader, when you have lots of different readers, you never know which, which each one is bringing to the table when they read the book or what they are looking for. All we can do is write the book um, as it kind of develops and as we want to, and hope that our readers um, kind of enjoy what we've done. I mean, there are things that we can do to kind of tweak expectation. So, for example, I wouldn't, I didn't begin the Split Worlds novels setting up a couple who are clearly supposed to be with each other. Um, so I, I don't think I entered into a contract with the reader that the story was going to be, do they end um, up together? Do you see what I mean? It's like establishing yeah. a kind of a, an implicit contractual agreement with the reader is something you can do consciously. But um, when you're mixing lots of different genres, you're just going to hope that they like the blend that you've created, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I Sorry, think there are, yeah, I think there are a couple of different ways in which people can mix up uh, genres. We lost Rod. Oh, anticipation. <laughs> the anticipation, yeah. <laughs> Um, shall I step in there? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, one thing I've found is that I sometimes can be, well, not guilty, it's quite conscious. For a start, I don't particularly want to signpost things because I like to mess with people's expectations a lot and subvert. Um, but secondly, sometimes I window dress. So um, I, uh, and I did that in Peacemaker a bit with the science fictional element for the first time ever. Normally the science fiction element always underpins everything that I write. This time it actually was more window dressing. I've written a young, a young adult novel or series that for all intents and purposes, as you read the three books, um, it was a dark fantasy that with vampiric-like creatures, they weren't actually vampires, but the denouement of course was science fictional. So it was very deliberate all the way to set up an expectation with the reader that this is the kind of book you're reading and then bang at the end of it I said well actually no, this is the kind of book you're reading. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then you take the fallout, <laughs> you know, and not everyone's going to like that, And but you know, that's okay, it's okay. Um, that's what keeps it interesting to write, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, I think by, you know, I, I said earlier about it, it being a danger, it is a danger, but it doesn't mean that it's something you should be afraid of as a writer, as the writer anyway. Yeah, and I think also as the writer, we're, we're kind of figuring out the world and, and doing all of these things. I don't remember at any point sitting down and saying, I am now going to embark upon it series of books, which is a blend of urban fantasy, and I'll drop in some hard boil. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> like that at all. It was just, here's this thing, and there's this other thing, and it just kind of grew like this kind of organic monstrosity. And then a long time afterwards, it's kind of sitting down, scratching your head, going, well, uh, I think it's urban fantasy. How do, oh no, my god, there's this entire argument all over the internet about what urban fantasy is. Okay, well, I think there's a bit of this and a bit of that, you know, it's is something that you, you sometimes have to retrofit which genre your stuff fits into once you get to the, am I going to be able to find a publisher for this phase? I don't yeah. worry so much of the writing. Yeah, and and if it makes it into a bookshop, where in the hell will they put it? On the yeah. shelf? You know, which shelf will they put it on? I, I, you know, I can't even begin to... Um, but, you know, you, you kind of, I mean, I, my opinion now, <laughs> after having written, been writing for a few years is that honestly, you know, there's so many things you can't control in writing. 
Um, you know, so you know, don't get caught up in worrying about them because all you're creating is unnecessary angst for yourself. Get out there and create. That's what you want to do. That's what it's all about. And then let other people make. You know, that whole reader reader relation. The reader's relationship with the text is is something that you can't interfere with. You have no control over that. So you just put it out there and see what comes back. You know. Unfortunately, you have me to uh, to help position fishes <laughs> from angry robots. Well, that's, that's great because that's that's the you know that's that's the critical feedback, the the critical thought that you want you want people to talk about it and you want them to think about it and um, you know the more discourse about something you write, the better. Um, that's the exciting bit. Mm. All right, so I think we'll continue on um, and hope that. Rod will be able to rejoin us again. Um, so I'm going to start jumping into questions um, from our audience. And Alex from Twitter asked, how familiar do you have to be with a genre, including the tropes, to be comfortable including it in a, or using it in a cross-genre idea? Oh, um, yeah, great question. Great question. So for either of you, pop in when you like. Um, Emma, do you mind if I go first? Go for it, go for it. Um, I think a lot. I think you have to be very familiar with uh, any genre you're writing because it's, you know, it's showing respect for your audience, you know. Um, and I think that it's only fair on them that you go in knowing what the tropes are, um, what what the cliches are, and um, how best to use or not use them. And um, it's just it won't work, I don't think, if you don't understand the genres that you're, if you don't read those genres specifically, because, um, you know, people people might, I've always, I don't know about you, Emma, but I've read so eclectically all my life and had real phases where I've read just exclusively romance or just exclusively science fiction and westerns, you know, spent long, and I, I feel I would not have the confidence um, if I didn't have that reading background to go and mess with them as much. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I, I agree with you, but I wish I could say that I've done the same, because I have to confess that I didn't actually read a lot of urban fantasy before I ended up writing my urban fantasy because I didn't know I was writing urban fantasy. I was writing this <laughs> real thing. <laughs> well, like, three, hey, that's fine. You didn't know. I didn't know. So I didn't know I had to research that. But there were a couple of factors involved in that. One is that all practically all of my kind of proper reading life was science fiction. I read science fiction, all science fiction all the time. And I sometimes strayed away into kind of contemporary lit mostly being dragged by other people and I'd go, oh no, 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 I don't like it there and I'd go back to um, sci-fi and then when I tried to look for other things that I might like um, and in particular in urban fantasy I kept finding stuff that wasn't for me so maybe there was a bit of me that thought well I want to write the thing that I can't find and yeah. so I don't know or maybe I'm just um, not as diligent <laughs> and I should have read a lot more widely. Well, I mean I think you know, you do have to take into account that you don't just get storytelling from books, too. You know, yeah. um, and there's a lot of urban fantasy yeah. in television and film. That's true. Yep, Abs and, and and that's just as valid a way of understanding the genre as anything. And in fact, if anything, the storytelling in television currently is just so magnificent, a lot mm. of it, that um, you know, it's such a great way. Um, you know, to as as um, as a consumer of fiction, to get your story, to get your story on. Yeah. Rod's back. Hey, hey Rod's back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hey. This is a bit of a nightmare today. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, thanks for keep uh, for keeping to pop back in for us. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start this now, so hopefully this should be all right. Oh, great. Um, so I'm going to pull a question from the Q and A app. So I've selected it. And that should make it show up for you all if you go to Q and A. Um, um, but I'll repeat it. Nice. Um, I'll just I'll I'll speak it aloud here. Question for any of the three authors: Do you feel that getting your setting to feel internally consistent is harder for a cross-genre novel? And Rod, I'll start with you. Um, that's a really interesting question. 
I, I don't perceive it as such. I think, um, for me, I suppose it started with setting, and so everything else was built to, around that. I was about to say built to serve that, but I don't think that's quite correct. Um, because it's a kind of iterative process. You, you, you have maybe a, an idea of a setting from which a character might emerge, and that might contribute to an idea of plot, and that might feed back into, into the, these other tonal questions. So uh, no, for me, the answer would be that um, I, I, didn't, I don't think it's harder in that sense. And for either of the other of you? Uh, I feel that uh, because I worked so hard on the power balance and the kind of the, the metaphysics that underpinned everything, there were always kind of checks that I would have to make mentally as to whether something would fit. Um, so no, I, I don't feel like it would... I guess you, you may have more to consider and more to think about and more to keep track of if you have a complex genre mashed world, but I don't think it's necessarily more than if you were writing a far future sci-fi that is in one genre. Yeah. There's going to be a huge amount of world building and stuff to think about, um, and it still has to be internally consistent. I don't think that necessarily the blending of genres creates that complexity of the task. I, I think it's, you know, it, how many degrees of separation you have from your everyday world that you interact with is probably the variable that's going to be um, more involved in that. Yeah, I, I'd agree with Emma. So, uh, some election day shenanigans going on? I don't know, that was really, it was like a weird spooky noise, but it's okay. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with Emma on that, I think. Um, you know, it, it's just a matter of asking yourself constant questions mm. about decisions you're making in the story as you go along, and that, that doesn't change from story to story, really. And having written far, far future um, science fiction, and, you know, in fact, doing that was, I, it was far more complex for me than um, the decisions I had to make. Um, in, in mashing all these genres together in Peacemaker, so. Okay, cool. So thank you, Dom. And I'm going to click done on this answer, on this question, and it should then vanish. Yes, such magical thank you, technology. Dom. Thank you, Dom. Uh, great. And then for everyone whose question I use, um, please get in, or I'm going to get in touch with you as best I can. And if you don't hear from me by the end of play today. Um, please tweet at me at Mike R Underwood uh, on Twitter with Angry Robot Live as the hashtag, and remind me that you asked a question that I used online, um, and I will set you up with a fancy Angry Robot prize. Oh, um, cool. yes! So spreading the love here, um, and now yeah. I'm going to hop over to a question from Paul Weimer, um, who was not able to to be in, but sent some questions ahead of time, um, and this one is going to be for Rod. Rod, what were the question? Uh, what were the challenges going from filmmaking to writing? How did you find your skills translating to other media? Um, okay, well, the, the journey was the other way around. It was from novel writing into filmmaking, and um, I think, I mean, it's storytelling at heart. It's all storytelling at heart. Um, uh, I suppose you could look at it in terms of similarities and differences. In the similarities. Uh, it's still a story. That's that sort of universal thing. Um, it still has to have a through line that, that that takes you from the beginning to the end, and you you still have to know what that through line is. Um, I think in terms of differences, uh, when I set out to write a novel, quite often, I mean, it's different if it's one in a series, but for uh, a standalone novel or the beginning of a series, I don't always know what that through line is until I've perhaps got uh, to the end of what you might call Act 1, at which point I can vaguely see where I'm going and, and, and the through line becomes becomes clear. But with filmmaking, uh, my experience has been you, you need to know that from the start, or that's the way I've approached it. Uh, and I think it's more doable with film because there's a heck of a lot less plot in a feature film than there is in a novel, for example. So you can kind of hold it in your head and, and manipulate it all at, 
you know, you can imagine the whole plot, which which I certainly find very difficult in, in terms of novel writing. The other thing about film is is the process is intensely collaborative, whereas novel writing you kind of sit on your own for a year or whatever it is, and and come up with this story, and then you get the res the response of people. With filmmaking, particularly if you're involved in the filmmaking process, which I've been fortunate enough to be, um, you realize that everyone, whether it's a makeup artist or a director, everyone is involved in storytelling. They're all contributing to that to that process. And so you, you kind of find you um, your story as you conceived it. Sure, it has to have the same through line all the way through this process, but um, it's, it's the story told three times, they say, once in the writer's study, once on set, and once in the editing suite. And actually, I think it's told an awful lot more times than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered your, your question. I just warbled around it a bit. But uh, um, I, I love both. They're so different. And actually, filmmaking has taught me a lot about economy in, in prose writing. Because in film writing, you know, if you've got to have a someone comes into a room and has a conversation, you do not show them walking through the door unless that act of walking through the door is important because mm. it's going to cost money to film it. Whereas, uh, you know, in a novel, well, it's just words, we can just, just put it in. But in fact, it, it's bloating your, your story out. And so that, that enforced economy uh, that you find in film is, uh, I think, Good uh, discipline. really useful um, for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, Rod? Do you write treatments for all your film work? My, it, it sounds very grand. I write, write film. It's, it's. Uh, I have so far one feature film credit, and that's the a movie that's just sort of taking its first steps out onto the festival circuit at the moment. So it's had very limited theatrical uh, release so far. That is a mockumentary called How to Make a Movie for Forty Three Pounds, and <laughs> it is a um, it, it, you know, it follows the journey of, of someone who has this task given to them to create a, a, a record-breaking, low-budget movie. And uh, so there's a lot of postmodern stuff going on with that, as you can imagine. Uh, so, so that's the only finished one. We, the, myself and the director I work with, we have a, a slate of other projects um, which cover a number of different genre areas. I think. There is not the same expectation of people to sit within one genre within film as as we might find in in prose writing. Mm. Mm. I just wondered whether I asked about whether you wrote treatments for them because I'm quite interested in that process of treatment because you know uh, uh, you speak to authors and they often say. Um, that if they write a synopsis, that the novel is nothing like the synopsis in the end. Whereas my understanding of film is that the treatment is exactly what it's like at the end. Is that correct? Um, that's the idea. <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> and with, that, with the treatment, you've got a lot more room. I mean, a synopsis you're going to use to send out to a publisher or something, maybe 300 words, 500 words. Really, realistically, how much can you say in that? Every novelist hates the process, I think, of writing it. Writing it. Uh, a synopsis, but a treatment, you, you know, you can, um, it might be nine pages or something like that for a, a reasonably detailed treatment, and it's it's not exactly scene by scene in the, the way that I've written them, but it's getting towards that, and uh, so it's a short story form of the story you're going to tell in, in, in the movie. Um, so I think it's a really useful uh, starting place, and certainly all the films that I've been involved in writing have started with treatment. Um, and really, we've written, created the story in treatment form and when, and kept on going through different iterations of, um, you know, in response to, to feedback of editing that and editing it and editing it until we get to a stage where we're really happy with it. And it's, we can go on that basis and then write the, the screenplay, which is really just a process of translation of one format to another by that stage. Um, although, obviously, you're adding the dialogue, but dialogue is not the story. Dialogue is, is a, a kind of a bonus to the story. It's a, a <laughs> colouring and deepening the character and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we've got a question from Rakib, and I'm going to pop it up here. Um, to all the authors, can you uh, share some innovative new cross-genre ideas you'd like to try in the future? Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll extend his question into other formats or media you'd like to write for. Mm. I've got a cross-genre thing I'm going to write, but I'm not going to talk about it, because that's one of my rules. Um, <laughs> that's right, yeah. think about it before I write it. Um, and it's not because I'm scared of people stealing it, it's because it's like a tiny little sapling um, in, inside me that needs to be sheltered from harsh winds and uh, temperature variation. And uh, there's nothing better than talking about it uh, to expose it far too early and kill it off. So, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got something which is a, a very, actually very simple genre mashup that I want to play with. Um, and in terms of other things I can talk about, oh my word. Uh, yeah, I'm going into screen writing, but I think actually 80% of the authors I know are doing that, so um, that's not anything special. Um, and uh, there are all kinds of uh, secret things I'm scrolling away on at the moment which I can't talk about. Rod, do you want to? Yeah, OK. Well, I. Um other media. I, I'm uh, at the moment trying to <laughs> trying to make. I'm writing, wrestling with a, a kind of online uh, presence for the, for the Gaslit Empire, which in, is sort of heavily uses Google Maps and uh, different uh, descriptions of things happening at different places, so you can navigate through. And uh, there being mysteries that you can kind of follow through. Uh, I'm quite happy to say that I'm doing it. Whether or not I'll ever manage to get it to work is a is another question. But it's quite fun. It's uh, you know, and I'm we got. It looks like it's more or less there now, and so that's something I'm enjoying. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, oh. Am I you there? Oh yeah, you're still there. Um, I'm actually, it, the, interestingly, Emma, I'm the opposite to you in that sense because if I, the more I talk about a project that I'm nurturing, the bigger it grows in my mind. Oh, that's so, nice. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so which leads me into saying that I'm looking. Uh, this project I have in mind is uh, it's kind of like Cormac McCarthy meets Michael Crichton. So um, it's mixing um, literary uh, with thriller, with post-apocalyptic. Um, it's kind of a bunch of things like that. And also, um, as you say, like every every writer that's working on a screenplay, I'm working on a science fiction, uh, a new concept. Um, like it's not an adaption from anything I've written. Called a science fiction screenplay called Stalking Daylight, which I've nearly finished now. And that was very much inspired by the movie Pitch Black. Have you ever seen Pitch Black? That was, yeah, uh, which I loved. Um, really loved Pitch Black. Loved Claudia Black, who was then went on to be in Farscape. And what was the other one that I wasn't so keen on? Went for about 20 seasons. Uh, it'll come back to me in a minute. But it's one, one where they all went through the big hole thing. From oh, Stargate? Stargate? Yeah, Stargate, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> she did go on to Stargate, didn't she, Claudia Blake? I yep. don't know. Don't know? I, no one? Okay. The the end, end, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, okay. Anyway. So yeah, I'm working on that, and then there's the game writing as well. Um, but I pretty much could guarantee that anything I write going forward is going to be genre blend. I can't ever see myself um, writing, a, you know, literally writing a, a one novel staying in one genre ever again. Oh, I've remembered something else. Talking about moving between media, um, we're doing a live version of Tea and Jeopardy later in the year at um, FantasyCon um, in York in September, um, which will be like a theatre stage show. Oh, wow. Um, Are you going to have a, a live Foley artist? A, a live what, sorry? Foley artist. 
for yeah. sound effects. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're planning it out. It's, uh, <laughs> we've got some quite ambitious ideas for it, and I'm quite terrified. I um, hope there are going to be chickens. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. I think they're going to be like, where are the chickens? But uh, yeah, we, we have some quite a few ideas, and um, I think it's going to be kind of like a Graham Norton format meets. Oh, like, love like, Graham Norton. Yeah, where they, where they have like multiple guests and you know that that kind of thing, um, and peril obviously <laughs> without mild peril. So uh, yes, that's uh, going to be quite a big shift to go from podcast to um, live stage show. Yeah, yeah, that'll expose also you to all sorts of different feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm really good at being scared of everything, so obviously this is good thing to do. And, uh, but no, I think it'll be a lot of fun, and I think um, the people who listen to Team Jeopardy would actually get a, a big kick out of some of the things we've got planned. So, yeah. Cool. I'm certainly one of those people who listens to Team Jeopardy. Sorry? I'm certainly one of the people who listens to Team Jeopardy. I love it. Are you going to fancy Hon? Yes, yes. Oh, brilliant. Well, there you go. Excellent. And there is that. Whoosh. I've Great. got another uh, another sort of mixed genre thing that I forgot to mention. It's a, a film tr that's uh, actually in first draft screenplay, which is a kind of mixture between a sort of Shane Meadows uh, kitchen sink uh, Midlands type scene with a, a horror um, story that delves into the sort of demonic parallel worlds. Cool. Whoa, that sounds cool. <laughs> always that sounds ex more things to write. Yeah, always. That's the trouble. Too many ideas. I, I, periodically, I make myself stop and write them all down so I can see how out of control I'm getting. <laughs> and I take a step back. Yeah, I don't know yeah. about you all, but I think about it as a green room where all of the, the novel ideas are auditioning for my attention. <laughs> and some of them have been there for quite a long time, but they're very persistent. <laughs> yeah, so, well, that's right. They, they have to fight their way to the top, Mike. <laughs> yep. Uh, so I'm going to grab another question from the website here. So we've got quite a few left, uh, but I probably want to wrap up by the half hour uh, to let you all get back to writing. Um, <laughs> so this is from Louise on the website. Um, do you think the ability or the inclination to write cross-genre is related to a personality type or trait? And if so, what is it? The criminally... Ah. Mm. Sorry, I, was, did you say... I said the criminally insane, but I wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> I think people get bored. I don't know about you guys, but I get bored with straight, straight yeah. stuff, especially kind of like thrillers, film thrillers I can't watch anymore. Um, mm. So I think mashing it up kind of keeps it fresh, and when you juxtapose elements from different genres, suddenly you see new things in each genre, and that's kind of cool. I think there's uh, a, a sense in which there are two competing instincts. One is our enjoyment of um, the familiar and, and, and areas of aesthetic that we may be quite sophisticated in appreciating as readers, and, and the other is the desire for the new. And these two are kind of opposing forces pulling in different directions. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the same for writers and readers, that maybe the, there's a slightly different balance of those two inclinations for, uh, for, for different individuals. But, but I think where whichever voice is stronger will, will push us towards being more true to a genre or, or more um, naughtily in that in interstitial space. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I might just go with criminally insane. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that you, I mean, there has to be that little bit of um, uh, recklessness in uh, to to you as a writer when you really start messing around with genre like that. You have to, that that's that kind of letting go and saying, well, you know, let's mess with this. So. Um, you know, it's because some people, and in fact, people ask me about it so often that there's obviously an awful lot of authors or writers out there that feel very uncomfortable doing it. So, 
otherwise I can't imagine why they'd ask me about it. So um, there's, there's got to be, there, there does have to be something about personality in there, I think. And can I just say thank you to Yolanda Washington. Hi there, hi Yolanda, um, for answering and telling that Claudia Black was in Stargate. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's like, I, I don't know well enough, and that we're on the internet, so if I say it and I'm wrong, I'll be wrong forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yolanda, you have saved us. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Okay, and I've got one more question from the website. Um, from T.D. Bradshaw. An excellent author once told me that, that the principles of good writing can be applied anywhere and that a good author can turn his hand to any genre and that the only obstacle to this is marketing. Would anyone mm. agree or disagree? Can you just repeat that in, in its entirety, Mike, for me? Yeah, just a second here. An excellent author once told me that the principles of good writing can be applied anywhere and that a good author can turn his or her hand to any genre and that the only obstacle to this is marketing. Yeah, no, I don't agree in that the sense that they can, sorry, when you, I guess turn your hand to it is, is kind of a very broad brush stroke. Um, yes, turn your hand into it your hand to it in terms of reading it, understanding it, submersing yourself in it and then being able to adapt. Yeah, I would agree with that. But I don't think that you can just pluck a genre out of the air and unless you have some, I mean, it's like I was saying to you, Emma, about you don't have to have read it, but somehow or other you have to have an understanding of it. Um, to write it well. I, I do believe that. I mean, you could argue that people, um, I don't know, it's getting late and I can hear my brain winding down now as I'm saying it because it's, it's, uh, it's 11.30 p.m. over here. But I'm thinking some people, when you read something that's really fresh and new and that you haven't seen before, it's as though they've invented, like when I read Petito Street Station, it was like, wham! This is just, this is just so awesome. Um, so I, I do believe there are people out there that are so incredibly imaginative that that um, that it doesn't matter what they write and what genre they they're going to pull in something really special. But for most of us, I I think that um, you have to have some kind of understanding of the genre, and you can't just pluck it out of nothing. I don't know. I think also you have to want to really want to tell the story and if there's story. a cold hearted I'm going to go and write this now in this genre or whatever for whatever reason I think it, yes if you're a good enough writer you could learn the rules of a genre and blah 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 but I would worry that there would you would lose something special in that there isn't a burning need to write something or um, a story that you need to tell. I saw someone talking online, I can't remember where or who obviously because you know today, but um, they were talking about how so someone who was very 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 big in another genre um, wrote a YA book and they felt that yes they had obviously done their research but it, it didn't have a certain something, it, it felt cold because it was like they were applying rules rather than yeah. having a story that needed to be told. Um, so I think that would be where the danger would, would come in, that if you're, you're trying to write in something which you don't naturally burn to write, that, um, that it would miss something. Yeah, actually, uh, I remember listening to uh, an author speaking one time, he kind of writes war, war stories, uh, like fictional war stories, um, adventure. And he literally went, th he described it as he, he went through and he read various authors in the genre and literally made dot points about their, um, their pro you know, their formula. And then he wrote to that formula. Now, to listen to him talk about it, it's kind of like, you know, that's the antithesis of anything that I would recommend somebody did. Mm -hmm. but it actually worked for him in terms of he was quite a successful author. 
But I totally agree with what you're saying. If there's not the passion there to write it, then that's going to show. And yet you you talk to someone like him, and so you could argue a case for either, I guess, is what mm. I'm saying. But I, I personally agree with you that I think you need to have a passion and want to tell that story through that medium, through that genre. Mm. I'd agree with that. I, I, I think I would have said love. You've got to love the story you're, you're telling in some way, and... Um, uh, and that will mean, if if that is the case, that you will have immersed yourself in that in books or yeah. films or whatever of that genre, and it, and it will be an organic, natural process. Having said that, we are all different, and I'm struck by how uh, varied are the approach, approaches of different novelists. So I don't think one can draw rules for other people. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. A, I guess you just got to be wary of the arrogance of, well, I'm going to go write a romance novel because you know that's easy. I should be able to do that. You know, and that 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 bothers me. Um, so, whereas you, yeah, it's, it comes down to that kind of respect for your audience thing again. I think. Mm. Okay. Well, we're at twenty past the hour, um, so I wanted to kind of give everyone a chance to make some some closing comments, um, especially if there's a cross genre story you've enjoyed recently that you'd love to point people to um, across any media. And then um, please do make sure to, to kind of give website and or uh, a social media handle so the people from this conversation can go and check out um, you personally. And you, you, everyone can, of course, check out their Angry Robot works at Angry Robot Books. Um, so let's start with Emma. Oh, why did you start with me? Because <laughs> you're um, on the left. <laughs> um, I'm just trying. To, I'm desperately trying to think of all of the cross genre things I've forgotten again. Um, oh, I recently watched a series called The Returned, which I thought was phenomenal um, because it was um, kind of the zombie thing, but not. Um, it was it was a very kind of fresh exploration of people coming back from the dead, which really appealed to me. Incredible writing, and um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, as for where people can find me, well, I'm always usually on Twitter, um, and I'm M Apocalyptic there, which is E M and then Apocalyptic. And my website is uh, www.enewman.co.uk or uh, tinjeopardy.com if you want to find the part where all of the Tea and Jeopardies are. Uh, and that's it. Okay. Rod. Okay. Oh. Right. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, yes. That's so one of the questions. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, a, a cross genre thing. I, I would. Um, I just throw out to you a lovely book called Miss Miller's Feeling for Snow by Peter Hogue, which is sold as crime, but uh, I, it would be a spoiler to tell you that exactly what sort of uh, genre sidestep it does towards the end, but uh, it does one, and it's fabulously written. Um, as for where to find me, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, Twitter, uh, and, uh, at Rod Duncan, all, all one word. And uh, I have a website. I'm in the middle of revising my website at the moment. So if you go there, you'll, you'll kind of see a, a past me, which is uh, at uh, rodduncan.co.uk. And I have a, a, a blog called Author Intrusion. Is that uh, like an alternate history you? <laughs> yeah, well, I will have to rewrite my history and uh, then it will be an alternate history. Um, I'm going to, and I promise, I'm going to blog tomorrow morning when I wake up about all the great cross-genre stuff that I've seen recently because I can't think of a single one. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I will. I promise I will. So you can go and you can go to my blog at www.mariannedepierre.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at mdepierre, on Facebook, uh, Google Plus. Uh, all those things connect to each other. So and I do love to talk about TV and um, my other thing at the moment is uh, music videos, and lots of those cross genre as well. Absolutely adore Katy, Katy Perry's um, video clip for um, the, the Egyptian one. Can't think of the song now, but anyway, 
there's some really inspiring stuff to be got out of there. So storytellers, go look at some of the music videos out there to get your ideas. Have you seen the one with um, the lady, uh, or what's her name, I can't remember her name, who plays Joni in Mad Men, the really gorgeous, um, Christina Hendricks? She did a yeah. music video years ago, a sci-fi music video, which yeah. is amazing. Wow. I'll have to yeah. find it, um, I'll tweet it to you. Um, that I'd would be great. But it is brilliant, and I was just amazed at how much they told in this music video. It was great. Yeah. And, and she's... Yeah, <laughs> I've such a crush on her, so it's all good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all so much, uh, Emma, Marianne, and Rod, for being with us on Angry Robot Live. Thank you, everybody, for watching and for answering or for asking questions. Uh, I'm going to get in touch with everyone whose questions I used. I apologize for people who we didn't get to. I'm going to try and pull those questions and put them on the wrap-up page. So if our panelists have some extra time and can go and comment on those questions, we'll keep the conversation going. Um, so look for that wrap-up blog at Angry Robot Books. And thank you all for, for being with us. This is Angry Robot Live. Good night, good morning, and stay angry. <laughs>